The sensation of really clicking together, um, especially in the eight, it's a huge boat and you're deep in a race and you're at the thousand meter mark and you feel like an entire crew shift and you start moving. Nine people completely bought into that one stroke. The boat lifts and sends and physically it's a really incredible experience. When you have it, you know you have it. You feel it, you feel that boat, you feel that symmetry, you feel that, that swing, that rhythm. When you get that swing going, it feels like you can really roll forever. You don't feel like you're pulling hard. You don't feel that, that strain. You're just part of this whole rhythm and it's an exhilarating feeling. You can close your eyes and the boat just picks up and from the catch to the finish, there's not a hiccup. There's nothing that's preventing you from getting your blade in the water. It just falls into place. You see the, uh, you know, the spacing of the puddles from stroke to stroke, the rhythm between the drive and the recovery. All you hear is the bubbles running underneath the boat. The muscle fibers are all working in absolute unison. The boat just picks up and goes. There's just this breakthrough. And it just, it just flies, it literally lifts out of the water. You realize what just happened after the fact, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? I can't even describe what it felt like, but it, it had to be a moment when we reached nirvana in that boat. You reach some sort of nirvana where you don't need to think about the strokes you're taking. That's a pretty elusive feeling, but that's what guys are striving for all the time. And that's where you keep just practicing, trying to find that for the day of the race. It takes a long time, but boy, it's, it's sweet when it happens. We announced the birth of rowing and our new coach on May 23rd, 1964. John Ahern of The Globe said of Arlette, he quotes Graham Greene and Will Shakespeare as easily as he discusses stroking and laybacks. We had a trustee whose two sons had rowed at Harvard. Chandler Hovey was a Brahmin and an international yachtsman. He agreed to finance the project. Before you say, Power 10, we were underway. So I got here and Ernie was on the main part of the campus there. I had a boat and a few of the guys that he'd recruited over the summer. And they were grabbing, you know, anyone close to six feet or bigger that looked athletic. And they approached me about, have you heard about the sport? I says, no. So why don't you come to the first meeting? Well, okay, I got time before basketball starts, so I'll give it a shot. So that's what got me in the door. Because none of us had rowed, we were, very naive about the sport. In rowing, it takes time to get good. A lot of strokes, a lot of strokes, a lot of time on the water. And we didn't have that time. He pinpointed the important things so that we were learning how to row effectively and row hard. We just didn't know any better. Ernie was a great confidence builder and we went into every race believing that if we rowed well, we had a chance to win because that's what he told us. And he was right because we did. Victory followed victory. The exception, a deck length loss to Brown, who would finish third in that year's Eastern Sprints. Now, on to the Dad Vale, the small college championship. The freshman raced first, and we won, and in Philadelphia, when you finish, there's a current and there's a bridge just past the finish line, and we sort of drifted down through the bridge, and then there's, once you do that, then there's nobody on the sidelines. So all the cheering crowd is back on the other side of the bridge. But I happened to look up, and way up on the sidewalk, so there's a bit of a hill there, there's Ernie up there in his little tweed coat, and uh, the guy was throwing kisses to us. Um, he was just so happy that we set the, the tone for the day by winning that first race. He just came over and was waving and throwing kisses. No one had ever swept the freshman, JV, and varsity races. Fifty years later, they are still the only college to achieve that feat. Once that, those first crews started winning races, there was a spirit that certainly migrated to anybody else who came into the program in those following years. Even though the, pro, the Northeastern program was only a couple of years old when I went to college, when I got there, Northeastern was an established program. It was an established competitor. We didn't think about the fact that Harvard been, had been rowing for 120 years and Northeastern for two. We thought about Jim Dietz and these giants who were rowing down the river from us. They, they were good, they were just that good. The Huskies entered the 72 sprints undefeated, but Harvard and Penn were still the favorites. Our coxswain at the time, Frank, he lied to us. But the whole thing in, when we were rowing, our strategy was to keep wood on wood, keep a closed length most of the race. We knew we were fast in the last 500 meters, 
So keep that wood on wood. Well, little did I know, Harvard actually had open water on us. But Frank kept saying, you're right there, you're right there. Coming into 500 meters, we picked up the pace. We were take, making up a seat, a stroke. And then all of a sudden, you're not supposed to look out of the boat, but I snuck out of the corner of my eye. You could see Harvard. You could see him right there. And with about 20 strokes to go, I could hear Frank talking to Calvin, our stroke, saying, if we keep it here, we're going to win. And I, just thinking about it now, I get chills up my spine. When the Pens and Harvards finally woke up, it was too late. It was NU by 4.5 seconds. Now came the Henley and an attempt at the Grand Challenge Cup. Six miles to the west of London lies the small Oxfordshire market town of Henley. A dead straight course, one mile, 550 yards long, is marked along the Thames, just wide enough for two crews. In a semi-final row, NU dispatched the defending champion Tideway Scullers. Now, the big one, Ernie's ultimate dream. He's Ernie Arlette and uh, has led his great Northeastern crew to the Eastern Championship in the United States and has brought them over here in the, into the finals. However, the opponent was one of the most formidable crews in the world, the Russian Olympic Eight. Uh, do you think that the Russians are going to be uh, very, very tough for you today? No question about it, Jack. Uh, they will be very, very tough. I think the uh, toughest competition we've had to date. With regard to this afternoon's race, the boys are really up for it. And they have to do a job, and I think they have a chance of winning. You know, this afternoon we had one of the best eights in the world, the Russian Navy crew, WMF Moscow, and their opponents this afternoon are Northeastern University from the United States who yesterday beat Tideway Scouts. Two crews, they're aware of the starting procedure, and away they go. The near side, WMF Moscow, and the far side, Northeastern University. And they're certainly holding their own here at the moment. And the Russians may be finding this a rather tougher final than they'd expected. And we really have a tremendous final here in the Grand. They've got about 50 yards to go, and it's the Russian Navy just by half a length from the Americans. This really might be the best finish that we've seen in the final here so far, and the Russians are going to win it. With my word, they know they've been in a race. In 73, the Huskies cruised through the regular schedule. No one got within five seconds of them. We were making our mark. You know, we beat Harvard, we beat all the big boys. And again, with a relatively new program, it was the coach. It was Ernie. It was Ernie. I was able to observe one of the great coaches that there was, and he just kind of let me stay in the background. So I would watch what he was doing. I would see what he was doing. He was just a terrific coach. He really could get the best out of everybody. Arlette reached 65 years of age in 1977 and decided to retire. What a job. For the first time in 57 years of athletic history, the Huskies had a national championship, two Eastern sprints, a Dadvale championship, a regular season regatta record, of 70 wins to 27 losses. We can only continually echo well Road Ernie. Now, for the changing of the guard. Instead of a funny-looking middle-aged Englishman, we hired a young recycled football star. His name was Walter Buzz Congram. I felt like I was inheriting an established program, but I also had my own ideas about what I wanted to do in terms of style. I definitely coached a different style than Ernie. A major part of shifting the culture and getting the athletes to realize that it wasn't a two-season sport, it wasn't a three-season sport, it was a four-season sport. Buzz was like a master at bringing out the good in you. There is a talent that you don't know about, that Buzz will shape it, and before you know it, you're pretty fast. The IRA had been a thorn in NU's side. We were great on Quinn Sigamon, but the Mani Onondaga treated us with disdain. It's the Intercollegiate Rowing Association Championships, right? So you've got the Eastern Sprints and you got the IRAs, and that was one that uh, obviously we wanted to capture. There was a lot of pent-up um, desire, right, to, uh, to do right by the program and, and to go after it. Then, on the way to Syracuse, a tragedy. 
we found out when we got to the, um, to the dorms that there was an accident. A van rolled over. Beloved boatman Charlie Smith was killed. The crew was traumatized. Charlie was a beloved guy. He, he really bought into the program. He was really uh, with the guys, and, and they thoroughly enjoyed him and loved him, and he really enjoyed <clears throat> being with the team. You know, everybody knew that, that, that Charlie was excited to, to see the program coming back, and uh, you know, that's what made it very hard. We gathered together, and, and uh, the decision was made that we were, in fact, going to compete. And uh, we had just gotten a new boat, <clears throat> and uh, they named it the Charlie, uh, and that's what they rode in. In Thursday's heat, the Huskies tied the IRA course record at 545.06 and advanced to Saturday's final. One thing that, that, uh, that always sticks out in my mind is, is um, Lenny R. Coxon. And people that don't row don't appreciate what a Cox can do. Lenny was just pounding on the boat. You know, as we were taking seats, the adrenaline was just incredible. There, they were never headed. Whenever challenged, Coxswain Tim Leonard would chant, win it for Charlie. They did. They had extracted triumph from tragedy. It was just really an amazing amazing race uh, and they just went out and did what they had to do, pulled themselves together. It was, it was a really inspirational uh, performance by a bunch of guys who just really believed in one another. The next year, the Harvard race was named for Charlie Smith. We had raced the Crimson nine times on the Charles. We had lost nine times. Once again, with the chance of winning for Charlie and you bested Harvard by two seconds. We had some friends that rode at Radcliffe. They showed us a uh, paper, a cutout that was in the um, Crimson, and uh, it talked about the Harvard team, the crew team losing to a blue collar crew. It was uh, an incredible feeling, quite frankly, to, to have come back and, and beat them kind of at their own game, so to speak. The Congram era retained all the competitiveness of the Arlet era. Buzz had 83 dual race victories, eight IRA medals, four sprint medals, and two national championships. And most importantly, magnificent Henderson Boathouse. Seeing this boathouse completed and to have Northeastern finally have its own home and have a place for this proud tradition, I feel really good about that. After making his plans to attire, Conrad hired a young BC grad, John Pajednik, as his assistant in 1999. In 2001, the gauntlet was passed. Pojo, as I call him, was only 24 years old. The Northeastern way really resonated with me. The co-op, the background of the guys that were on the team, you know, where they came from, the industrious attitude that these guys had, you know, translated onto the water. One, two, three, you know, they were very, very willing and eager to work very hard and try and take whatever they were doing to a higher level. When I visited here, I saw the group, a group of guys that worked hard and were trying to build something. Coach Progenic called me in the office and we talked a little bit about that. It's got me pumped about it. Northeastern Men's Rowing wants to have a group of common men with an uncommon desire to succeed and that every day we, we have the collective speed of the program exceed the sum of our parts. We're one of a, a select group of programs that trains a, a, a big group of guys very, very hard day in and day out and they push themselves. You know, they push each other. Coach Progenic will push you to a limit that you do not believe you can reach. You realize that you can just get a lot faster than you, you thought you could. You break your limits. No other college rowing program has accomplished so much in such a short amount of time. It's an amazing story of jumping into a sport well after there had been a very, very traditional pecking order established and a very, very rigid structure of who's allowed to be good at this and who's not. We had no regard for that, and we still don't. We we're just expected to work hard and to win. And that spirit still lives. You know, Northeastern is, is not going to roll over. We put a lot of miles on the water. And if you're going to sit next to us at the starting line, you know you're going to have a hard time beating us. I used to sit at the starting line, and I would look over at that six man. I was the six man. And in my mind, I'd say, I am going to kick your butt. And when you get eight guys that are doing that exact same thing, you get a fastball. When you bring up Northeastern, anybody that's associated with rowing understands that it is an elite program. 
every generation passes something on to the next generation. There was such spirit and desire uh, and work ethic that first year. We just set the tone. Everybody has bought into it ever since. To be part of the same tradition is, is really quite special. Sometimes we are looking at those pictures, pictures of sprint winners. We know their names, we know who they are, and we take some inspiration from them, yes. To know that people care, people who have done this, people that have come before you as an oarsman, and they really care about how you do. Not for themselves, but for you. They, they want to see you go out there and have the chance to experience what they experience, and we really hope we can make them proud. After 50 years, I feel we can safely say, well rode, Northeastern, well rode.